We live in an era where every company is expected to operate as a media company, and every business executive is expected to produce thought leadership content. Newsletters and blogs have become crucial mediums for establishing long-term relationships with customers, and you've probably noticed that your LinkedIn feed has been flooded with posts from CEOs and startup founders who want to share their expertise. But what happens when those CEOs don't have the time or the writing expertise needed to produce compelling content? They often turn to ghostwriters, trained journalists who are able to quickly distill executives' thoughts into shareable copy. These ghostwriters often work behind the scenes, in fact most people barely know they exist, and they can often make much more money than your average journalist. But how do you break into ghostwriting when they're effectively invisible, and what's the best way to work with clients? To answer this question, I assembled a panel of ghostwriting experts to share their experience from building their businesses. Hello, I'm Simon Owens, and this is The Business of Content, the show about how publishers create, distribute, and monetize their digital content. This episode is actually a recording from my Office Hours series. Several times a month, I pick a topic, assemble experts on that topic, and then invite paying subscribers to attend a live Zoom call. These aren't boring webinars, but rather it's a discussion where everyone is able to interact and contribute. After it's over, I distribute the recorded video to subscribers who weren't able to attend. Subscribing not only grants you access to the office hours, but it also supports the work I do here for this podcast. If you want to join, then go sign up at my newsletter at simonowens.substack.com. That's simonowens.substack.com. Okay, now on to our discussion. Today's topic. So today's topic was talking about, you know, building a successful ghostwriting business. This is a industry that's very large and very vibrant within the content space, but it's also because it's kind of behind the scenes. It's something that not a lot of people, even professional writers even know about. They don't know about how to get into ghostwriting, but it can be like a really great way to kind of fill out a consulting business or to diversify your revenue. If you're like a freelance writer, especially since it can be sometimes, you know, quite lucrative, Um, you know, as you'll hear from some of the guests today, a lot of times it will pay many times and multiples what you could get from, uh, uh, from a freelance rate from a publication. In fact, you talk sometimes talk to ghostwriters who ghostwrite for like CEOs who write for Forbes, where they're paid a lot more than what actual Forbes freelance writers are paid, which is which is kind of ironic. So it's 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 a great field to get in. It's a growing field since there's so much emphasis on uh, content marketing and how every every brand needs to act like a media company now. So every brand from the smallest local businesses to large national organizations and nonprofits are in need of good content writers, thought leadership writers, and so their need of this skill set. So for today's session, you know, I invited on several um, featured guests, people who can speak to this topic. Uh, the first is Jonathan Rick. Hey, Jonathan, he's a good friend of mine, lives close to me. He's been working for over a decade as a con- communications consultant, uh, doing a variety of, th- variety of things. But one of the big things that he does is ghostwriting. And his ghostwritten work has appeared in a lot of major news organizations like the New York Times and Fast Company, but then also blogs and uh, you know trade publications as well. We also have Dan Gerstein, another friend of mine who I've hung out with on multiple occasions. He actually has a really interesting perspective because not only does he work a lot on the book ghostwriting side, but he runs an agency in which he basically brings in clients and then connects them with good ghostwriters to to write books for them. We have Wayne Pollock. I might be pronouncing that correctly, so correct me once I call on you, Wayne. Uh, But he's the founder of a uh, communications firm that services a specific niche, usually law firms. So he can um, he can kind of speak to that aspect of kind of niching down into a specific expertise and bringing in clients. That way, we have Matthew Reese, another friend of mine who I've met in person. Uh, He runs an editorial consulting firm. uh, So creates all kinds of uh, content for uh, clients. And last but not least, we have Pat Pat McNeese. Um, and she has done a lot of ghostwriting over the years, and she has an interesting perspective to offer in the sense that she works on a lot of ghostwriting for, I think, authors who are not famous or um, you know high-powered CEOs who are like families that want memoirs written and stuff like that. So she'll be able to speak um, to to all those aspects. So with all that said, let's jump into it. I'll start 
asking questions, but again, feel free to unmute your mic or write into the chat or whatever you want to do to kind of call attention to yourself if you have any follow-up questions or have anything to add on top of what we're talking about. So let's start with Jonathan. So one of the things I think is always top of mind with this kind of work is how do you get into it when the entire nature of the 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 profession is in so, somewhat hush hush in the sense that you're you don't have a byline approach you know attached to it if i write a freelance piece for the verge an editor from wired could see that piece in verge and say hey simon you you wrote a great piece why don't you freelance for me whereas if you ghostwrite a piece for the verge it's not like that wired editor is going to reach out to you or anybody else is going to reach out to you so like so if you were giving advice to a maybe a freelance writer who had some journalism experience into how to break into ghostwriting and find clients, what would be some of your advice, Jonathan? Thanks, Simon. Pleasure to be here. We are uh, uh, very uh, close uh, in distance, although totally different states. Simon, of course, <laughs> is in the district, and I'm, oh my God, in a different Mr. Jefferson state, such a, mm -hmm. a huge uh, difference. Um, let me give you four points, I thought, um, and thank you for, for the, the question. Um, First, here's the good news. Uh, you're already a ghostwriter. Um, if you've ever written a news release, you're a ghostwriter. Every PR pro knows that the you know quotes in a release are made up. If you've ever worked on Capitol Hill, you're a ghostwriter. Every staff assistant knows that those constituent letters aren't actually written by your boss. Uh, Second point, um, uh, relatedly, when I tell people that I'm a ghostwriter, they almost always assume that I write books. I don't. In fact, I basically do everything except books, uh, op-eds, blog posts, Wikipedia pages, website copy, writing workshops, slide decks, and so on. I call this niche short form thought leadership, and I've been able to carve out a career on its basis. Third point, um, many ghostwriters, including me, uh, uh, as well as uh, uh, Dan and Matt, um, have experience as a journalist. And that training is helpful, but at a certain point, you need to alter your mindset dramatically. You're no longer reporting, you're opining. You no longer have readers, you now have clients. You're in the service business, and your goal is to serve your clients, to present their version of the story rather than the most identifiably objectable one, uh, objectively identifiable one. Um, here's an obvious example. Uh, as a reporter, you would never give someone your profiling pre-approval of your copy. As a ghostwriter, that's exactly what you do. And then finally, uh, one more point. As a ghostwriter, you're also a business person. Um, that's right, you're running a company. So you need to prepare yourself for everything that that entails. Proposals, negotiating, invoicing, scope creep, referral networks, client care and feeding, self-promotion, juggling multiple deadlines, health insurance. The list goes on and on. Sure, you can hire an assistant. You can even hire subcontractors, more paperwork. But be aware up front that writing is the easy part. Building a business is the hard part. So like going into the building, the building a business part, though, and we'll definitely dive into like some of the logistics stuff further down. But like in terms of how you find those initial clients, like one thing I've noticed you is like you kind of devote like pockets of time to business development, probably more than I ever did when I was doing my own ghostwriting. But you also, you write blog posts about, you know, things that you're learning. You're constantly kind of t taking things that you're learning and kind of writing quick, like LinkedIn posts about it so that your network sees it. But then you also are looking at different forums where people are kind of putting out feelers for wanting help with different content, like uh, content related stuff. What are some of the ways that you can find clients when you can't necessarily, you know, use your the a lot of your writing as like a calling card to 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 to, to direct people to you. Um, do you want me to take that? Yeah, yeah, Jonathan. Fantastic. I have another <laughs> long prepared answer, uh, believe it or not. Um, I'll just read it uh, as if you know. I'm just kidding. Um, but so first, uh, again, four points. You know, like um, where is he? Uh, the guy Wayne. I you know am. Uh, call it OCD. You know, I have three points and two subsections. Uh, 
Uh, so first, exploit your existing network. Send an email to your friends, family members, old bosses, colleagues, associates. Post on LinkedIn and above all, create a website that explains your offerings. And I, and I want to note something about the website. The, your first site need not be fancy. In fact, this is something you can create yourself. But in my opinion, your first site, your second site, whatever, it needs to do one thing individual pages. It needs to have individual pages. That is, don't have one landing page where you list everything you do. Instead, create separate pages for each offering. Uh, LinkedIn profiles, Wikipedia pages, writing workshops. Why is this extra work important? Because if someone is looking for help with their newsletter, it's great that you also write books, but they want to see your newsletter chops, not your nonfiction ones. Yeah. Second, so to just kind of like, so if someone approaches you and they say, I want a Wikipedia page written, it's not like here's a 5,000 word ex explanation of my services. You've created a separate landing page that breaks down how you work on a Wikipedia page and what the process is and stuff like that. Yeah, you know, it kills me. Um, I'm a member of a, a bunch of sort of different groups. Um, and, you know, oh, hey, someone says I'm looking for a ghostwriter. I'm looking for a Wikipedia uh, consultant. And somebody will either say, hey, I can help you. No link. Or if they do uh, post a link, um, it's to their like their, their homepage rather than the specific offering that is being asked for. And that small amount of friction, believe it or not, um, can be a deal maker. If, you know, I have to browse through your site to figure out, you know, you, uh, that you've written tens of hundreds of Wikipedia pages, um, I might get bored and move on to the next guy. Yeah. Wayne, you had your hand raised. So I wanted to talk a little bit about your direct question, which is how to get more clients when you are just starting out in a field where it's very hard to get referrals. And I think that there's a couple of points here I want to make. One is that you can't be afraid of direct cold outreach. Yeah. HubSpot has ruined it for people where, you know, they have the idea of you just publish it and people will find it and you'll have inbound leads until the cows come home. That's not how it's always going to be. I think you have to embrace cold outreach, but on a related point, you have to embrace niching down and you have to embrace positioning. You if you know who your audience is, it is CEOs of manufacturing companies of between 10 million and $500 million in revenue. That is going to catch people who are in that category. If you hold yourself out as just an executive ghostwriter, it's not going to be a good connection because people don't know you yet. Obviously, when you have a name and you have a reputation, different story, but I think you need to be uh, comfortable with cold outreach, targeted cold outreach, and you have to kind of reverse engineer your outreach. So if you know that a prospective client is going to want to know if you have writing samples, is going to want to know who other types of clients you might have in their field, work backward and make sure you've got writing samples ready, or maybe you redact the, uh, you know, any identifying information, assuming that your agreements allow you to use content as writing samples. Um, just think carefully about this. I, I don't understand, and I'm I'm talking from a niche perspective, a, a niche specific position perspective. I don't know how people could be flat out ghostwriters without niching down because I don't know how they're taken seriously by their clients. If you know, same thing of going into a diner and ordering an Italian uh, dinner versus going to an Italian restaurant ordering an Italian dinner. So yeah. I would I would caution people: you've got to know who you're talking to, and you've got to make your message fit them and and what they're thinking about and why they need a ghostwriter. Yeah. And Dan, I'll call you in just a second. Um, so like it, it, kind of what you're speaking to the whole niching down, like I think a lot of the people here are kind of more generalist. I've done a lot of ghost writing. Obviously, I think things like, like, especially like relating to like legal things, obviously there, you, you do reach a certain level where it really does help to have someone who has a lot of experience that, and that will always give you a leg up compared to um, if someone who isn't a specialist in that area, I can see it kind of going both ways. Like if you like niching down and, and especially with like law firms that have, you know, a lot of money to spend, uh, focusing specifically on that. And I think that a lot of ghostwriters will pick like a very few number of subjects that they 
kind of target and they kind of gravitate gravitate to toward and can show examples that they've written in that field. So that's definitely, you know, good advice is, is like, what, like, are you just a generalist or are you trying to learn a very specific subject matter and, and develop that expertise? And then that'll help you in terms of standing out because anybody on Upwork or Fiverr or something like that can, can claim to be a writer and can work for bottom of the barrel prices. But if you do want to like raise, you know, raise your prices and work for like a premium amount, having that niche expertise certainly helps. Dan, you had something to say? Sure. Um, I just want to pick up on a couple of things Jonathan and Wayne just said um, and add a little context. Um, to your first point about how do you break into this, um, you know, Jonathan hit the nail on the head that a big part of, of, the, of making that conversion, especially if you're, you know, uh, uh, primarily trained as a journalist, right, is it's a mindset shift, right? You have to stop thinking yourself as a writer and uh, start thinking of yourself as a service provider. And more importantly, um, you're a solution to someone's problem, right? A lot of the people who are hiring writers, either they don't have the time, they don't have the ability, whatever the reason for it is, they have a pain point, they have a problem, and they need a solution. And the more that you can present yourself as a solution to the problem, you're not pitching them, you're not begging for work, you're saying, I, I have something that you need and they're happy to hear from you. Yeah. And, and so um, one thing though, I will kind of um, offer a slightly different perspective than Wayne about how do you get clients. Um, I think there is a place for outreach, um, especially as you're trying to kind of build a practice. But my experience has been um, because there are so many writers out there, um, cold emails, um, cold calls, are the cost, the, the cost benefit analysis, the return on the investment, I don't think is worth it. I think a much better strategy um, is to take a, a, a borrow from Woody Allen, one of my favorite writers, 70% of life is just showing up. Go to places where your clients are gathering, prospective clients are gathering, right? And this feeds into the, also the conversation around developing an area of specialization. I 100% believe that given the massive amounts of freelance writers that are now in the market and available to do this work, you have to find a way to differentiate yourself and show why you're a better solution than the thousand other writers that might be cold emailing this person. And part of that, I think, is understanding you know, what your strength is, what you can do that other people can't, and then connecting with those people um, where they live. Right. So if you especially is like Wayne, like you're um, uh, specialized in legal writing, right? Go to bar events, right? Where there are literally often hundreds of people who potentially could use your services. Writers typically don't do this. So if you, again, if you want to compare competitive advantage to be in a position to kind of meet lots of potential clients face to face, um, start a conversation. What do you do? I'm a, I'm a thought leadership writer specializing in, in, in legal issues. Oh, that's really interesting. I could, I potentially could use some help or, you know, I have a colleague, um, those kinds of, you know, five, 10 minute conversations I find are far more valuable and get much more ROI than a thousand cold emails, um, or calls. Yeah. And I, I built up, you know, prior the origin story of my newsletter is it was more like a lead generation for me. I had like a, you know, I built up like a six figure business of just like content writing, including a lot of ghost writing. And really, I was just writing about the media industry, the content industry strategies and stuff like that. And that created kind of like a funnel of people who were interested in my work. And then I just had like a call to action that said something like, do you like the kind of content I'm creating? I could create something like this for you. And all my, you know, you only have to convert a small number of those readers into retainer clients. And then suddenly you're making, you know, a really decent living. So I think like for Wayne, it's like really good to do the cold pitching because he's so niched down that like he's, cause I get so many emails of people like who don't even understand what I'm doing, who offer to write for me. And they're just like copying and pasting and they're not offering any kind of differentiation. 
And but if you're like a law firm and someone who speaks your language and specializes in that thing, cold emails you. I think that uh, I think that's where cold, the kind of cold pitching is probably a little bit more effective. But I agree with Dan on the whole of the more kind of networking or creating your own content on your own website within the niche that you're trying to break into can sometimes be really you know effective. Matt, I saw you unmuted yourself. Yeah, I was just going to echo, um, <clears throat> I think, what Dan said and just make two points, um, which is not so much on getting the clients, but sort of um, getting, you know, ongoing business. And yeah. um, there's, you know, there's this issue of kind of out of sight, out of mind. And so how do you um, how, basically how do you stay visible and how, how are you reminding people uh, that you're available? And so the one is just the obvious thing, which is to dance. Uh, what Dan said, it's sometimes it's just showing up. And I, I, there have been several occasions, but there's one client in particular where this person is so busy that I don't know, they don't, they don't think of me. And then I, I just go and I don't even have something specific. And I just, we go and we have a meeting. And he's like, oh, I've got this big project that I really would like you to do. If I hadn't shown up, he probably wouldn't have, he would never have called. And so that, that has happened with several clients. You just, you, you have that sort of this discussion and it doesn't even have to be about something specific and it leads to uh, work. And then the second thing um, I, when I just, when I was getting going, I had a client, it was a well-paying client and I frankly didn't have much to do. And it was a monthly retainer, which sounds great, but I also knew it wasn't sustainable. And so I, I started uh, just doing, he was, they were, this client was in the financial services business. And I just started doing a, basically a, a weekly news summary for this, just for this one person. And it was just sort of bringing together sort of facts and figures um, distilled from, and it wasn't, you know, it was not just links to articles. It was actually, here's the most interesting data point in this article. And I started doing it for him. And then I just started doing it for more people because most of my work was in financial services. And so it was something that I, that people were getting an email from me every single week in sort of related to the subject matter that I was interested in working on for them. It lent me, frankly, a degree of expertise and credibility that I didn't have, but they didn't need to know that. And, but more importantly, it just, it reminded, they were seeing my name every single week. And I would like to think that that sort of helped me uh, help them think of me when they had when they had work that needed doing. Yeah, and and that goes that speaks to kind of Wayne's point of the whole nicheifying is like if you are targeting a potential type of client, then you can start creating content that attracts that client. Wayne, do you do that? Do you do you create like legal content during your free time to kind of build up like a little bit of brand recognition within the legal space? Yeah, so I'm a big believer. If you're going to be in the content industry, you better be producing content. I, I can't yeah. believe people that that hold even large PR firms hold themselves out as you know great content creators and, and smart strategists, and then have nothing on their blog. So yeah, I have a blog. I have videos on YouTube. I have a podcast. I my goal is to put out their content that isn't hire a ghostwriter today, but right? most of my content is about yeah. best practices in thought leadership because I want people to understand the value of thought leadership. And then when they inevitably realize the value and they know they have no time, they start to think of other options. They look around, they can't see anybody else in their firm doing this work because they're too busy. So they think about outside sources. So um, yeah, I think you have to be, you have to put the content out there because you don't know who is looking at it, who's listening to it, who's reading it. And it gives you credibility because to be able to get a referral, uh, to Dan's point, you get a referral based on a networking event, but then they go to your website and and um, I, I forgot who mentioned it, um, uh, but the fact that you have an empty website doesn't help you. So yeah. it's all part of the integrated. And, and I agree that if you can network with an audience that you know, that is going to be there, that that is a fit for you. Yes. I mean, it, it's really inbound. It's a combination of inbound, outbound, networking, all the kind of new, normal marketing. And the, in, and the inbound helps the outbound because if they if you cold email someone but they already read your newsletter or something or sort of know who you are, then that's going to make it a little bit easier for them to for them to answer. Yeah, and you have to look at at some of the statistics. Like I've done research for keyword search terms like law firm ghostwriter. It's mm -hmm. not heavily searched as you can imagine. Yeah. So what yeah. I have to do is think a bit more broadly and think about more about branding and positioning and authority building and not just uh, Google or Bing, you know, keywords and bringing people from a web search. 
Yeah. So I want to uh, uh, ans- ask some questions about the book writing process. I'll go to Dan first and then Pat, because I think you can both speak to a little bit different sides of it. Dan, you run an agency where you connect clients to ghostwriters and you kind of act as kind of like a middleman. In the book writing space, I know it's probably a little bit of all of the above, but where are most of the clients coming from? Is it like some kind of CEO saying, I want to write a memoir or something? Or is it someone on the publishing side, like like who works for the publisher, who's saying, I have, an, I have someone, a celebrity or someone, but I need to pair them with a good writer? Like what, how does that dynamic work? Um, well, for us, and I would imagine, um, and Matt, uh, has worked on a number of books can probably uh, echo this as well. I don't want to speak for Pat yet because we haven't met, but um, <laughs> I, I suspect it might be the same with her. Um, most of the assignments that come from literary agents and publishers, it's a very insular community, right? And incestuous, they all talk to each other and they, and in particularly liter- literary agencies, um, especially the talent agencies, they try to keep everything in house. So it's very rare that they're gonna go outside to someone like us um, or to individual writers if they don't know them and Mm -hmm. more importantly, don't represent them because they want both ends of the deal. So the overwhelming majority of authors that are coming to us and looking for help and um, sourcing a writer and then getting some advice on their publishing strategy um, are coming to us directly, right? And at the very beginning of the process, more often than not, they don't have a literary agent. In many cases, they're not going to traditionally publish. They're going to do some form of self-publishing. Um, and one of the reasons they're coming to us is because publishing is such a closed loop, mysterious, impenetrable world to outsiders, they're looking for a trusted guide um, to give them good counsel as well as to help them find a ghostwriter. And you know, so we put a real premium on developing expertise about the publishing process as well as you know, story development um, and ghostwriting. Interesting. And so, and Pat, you developed kind of a niche where I think you started working with individuals kind of like that, what Dan is kind of talking about, where they want a story told, right? Is that is that kind of the, na- the nature of how your relationships, like I, I lived an interesting life or my father lived an interesting life? Like what, what, how are the, what, what are the kinds of ways that you work with, with writers when you are with people when you're writing books for them? So I live in the D.C. area, too, and I was doing a lot of writing for places like the World Bank, where they would hire you to do a kind of an engaging short summary of what a report was about. And the report was really boring. And um, uh, I was asked to give a talk for ASJA, a journalist organization, and I said a line describing how to get that work. I said, the more boring the work, the more you can charge, and which was true. And a woman who ran Dial a Writer wrote down my name and wrote boring and funny next to it. And the next week, a job came in from the Midwest. Somebody had bought lunch with Kitty Kelly, and they wanted to have the life story of their father-in-law told. This was a man who ran an industrial company, and he was a really had a very boring life. And um, so I went, they flew me out to talk to him and, and other people. And while we were talking, the PR person for the firm fell asleep while we were talking. So this is an <laughs> example of how really you just never know what's going to pay out. And I did get the gig. They said, go with a middle-aged woman of all the people they interviewed. Uh-huh. And I, I interviewed this man. And of course, like a lot of boring Midwestern people, their life was actually fa- fabulous if you put it in the context of what it was like to grow up in the country in the Midwest in the 20th century. So that book got published and they published, they, uh, the publishing company published about a 5,000 printing. And I gave those books out liberally and people would say to themselves, this man is very boring. My father is fascinating. She could, if she could do this with a boring man, she can really do something with my father. And I just started getting a lot of gigs because of that. So it was uh, just pure, pure word of mouth. Pure word of mouth. And, and, uh, and, how, and did also they, how did they know? There was a sample out there. I mean, I, yeah. they really got out there and people would say, I, you know, this is a good idea. We could do this. And then 
and then I, I began that when I found a publisher uh, who later went out of business, but in the meantime, they had 10,000 copies in circulation. Late, I began doing the managing the publication myself. And that's valuable because a lot of people want a book, but they don't, they're not going to get it published by Harper and Rowe. Mm -hmm. And so if you know the production process, and I had been an editor in book publishing for eight years, if you know the production process and you can do the interviews and write the story and then get the book published, uh, I, you can get as much from, I, I think I got paid, this was when I started in the 90s, from like 25,000 for just doing the interviews and getting a story kind of pulled together from that to 60,000 for uh, a, a full thing. And then it, eventually I started also doing histories of organizations, which was more lucrative and also more fascinating. But I always kept doing the biographies, the memoirs. It would yeah. often be in their voice, but sometimes that first book, it, there was no way the man couldn't brag. He simply wasn't able to make himself sound good. But yeah. if you, you could get the content from him, but you had to write it about him. You could brag about him, but he could not say him, things himself that would make himself sound fascinating. So your competitive advantage was not just that you were a writer, but also you could help with the publishing process. You, you, cause obviously that's very intimidating, especially to someone who doesn't work in book publishing at all and really doesn't know what goes into that. So, so one thing, and this is kind of, you touch on this, and I want to start with Jonathan on this, but uh, you know, I want to also open um, uh, open it up to everyone else as well is, is pricing. So I kind of started this up, this off with the, the kind of lure that you can make a lot of money on this, if you, uh, you know, with all things come together, but as you spoke in the beginning, Jonathan, this is a business. You got to think it's it, like a lot of journalists, a lot of writers aren't good business people. You, one thing that you always admonish me on back when I was doing this is I don't charge enough. You charge a lot of money. What are the ways, given that, like I said, you can go on Upwork or Fiverr and, and, and you know, hire people for very ch cheap, like how do you approach the entire pricing s situation in terms of explaining your value and, and stuff like that to clients? Yeah, it's a great question. And I'll, I'll tell you that I've, I've learned from Dan in this regard that what we do is, is uh, not, you know, putting a hammer to a nail. We're not selling widgets. We're selling a bespoke service. Um, and, and two thoughts occur to me, you know, uh, um, you get what you pay for. And um, there are plenty of, of people who, uh, who come to me, for example, we look at Wikipedia work who have tried to do this on the cheap. They went to Fiverr or Upwork and hired somebody for like 500 bucks um, who has then totally screwed up the project, made the situation a lot worse. And whereas, uh, whereas if they hired me from the get-go, it would be one price. Now the hole is deep. I have to charge them the price to do the work and to fix the problem. And I will tell clients, you know, if they say, listen, I have sort of standardized, templatized replies that I can tweak. Listen, there are plenty. I, I, this is an investment in your reputation. Um, and there are, I, I know it, I know it is expensive, but half the people who come to me and uh, end up doing so because they tried to do it on the cheap. So Matt, like what, what how yeah, is your- Well, I, I, I was just gonna, the, my broad um, point on pricing is I, I try to do as much as I can just on an hourly rate because I find that most clients, prospective clients, they have no idea how much time is going to be involved. And, um, and you often end up in situations where the process is a little, um chaotic and they say they want x and then they want y and then it becomes j and you have a lot of people involved and so the um my sort of what i figured out early is i don't mind getting jerked around if it's just more money in my pocket and yeah. um and so and there have been a i'm there have probably been times when i'd set a flat fee i might have been paid more but i i I don't know. I feel like it's just very risky to set a flat fee because I've learned early on that clients, your entities, they don't really like you coming back at some point and saying, well, we agreed on this, but it's taken a lot longer. So I need more money. And you just sort of avoid that. And I, I explain my whole rationale that um, I will tell them, here are things you can do to actually accelerate the process. You can 
give me an outline, research. They almost never do that. I think most of the clients I'm dealing with, frankly, are not terribly price sensitive and they're hiring me because, or they're just hiring a speechwriter or a ghostwriter because they don't want to do it. And if it's for the CEO, sometimes it really doesn't matter what it costs, whatever it's going to be, it's a rounding error for them. And so, um, Anyway, so the, the broad point, though, is whenever possible, at least I find um, charged by the hour. That's interesting because I came kind of to the opposite conclusion is that you give them an hourly rate that creates st sticker shock because if you say $250 an hour or something like that, then they're they're like, holy crap, that can add up to a lot. And it's not really telling them the information it's going they need, which is how much is this going to cost me? It's just giving them some open-ended number that could yeah. quickly run up. But I understand what you're saying about scope creep and stuff like that and, and stuff like that. So, and I think this gets to what I want to talk about now is the process of working. And I'll go to Wayne first and maybe Dan, who can speak at it a more higher level, but Wayne, in terms of like the structure of working um, with a client, I think every ghostwriter does it a little bit differently, but it, but they, most of them try to create a formula so that it can, it's like a repeatable process. It doesn't spin off into like, you know, a million different things when you're ghostwriting like let's say like three art like you have like a contract for three articles with the client how do you keep them on focus and how is your process so you can make it as efficient as possible so i like to say that i'm not just a ghost writer i'm a ghost thinker because what i do is extract ideas through these attorneys minds and work with them to finesse that into something that might be of actual interest to their clients and their referral sources. So most of my thought leadership is in the 1,000 to 2,000 word length bylined articles that are submitted to Reuters or Bloomberg Law or another legal industry trade publication or a publication that serves the industry that their client is in, construction industry, medical device industry, et cetera. So I have a lot of the lawyers who come to me and they have an idea for an article, but they just don't know how to say it or what the point is. So a lot of the work is, is talking through the idea and trying to get to fit into a framework, whether it is five considerations for, or trends concerning, or red flags, not to make it sound like it's SEO clickbait, but it's helpful to get them to understand that if this article is going to be of interest to your prospective clients, your current clients. A lot of lawyers use thought leadership as a client uh, retention tool, right? If a yeah. client is paying a million dollars a year to a large corporate law firm, they want some added value. And the added value is the lawyers talking about things happening at the DOJ or the SEC or recent case law or industry trends. So it's working with the lawyers normally for, you know, between a 15 and 30 minute conversation to walk them through the their thought process um, as a lawyer, I think it's hard for them to understand how to convert those kind of raw thoughts into an article. So I try to work through that with them. And, and my analogy is it's like putting together a jigsaw puzzle, but you don't have the box. You don't know what yeah. it looks like, but yeah. you can kind of have a sense. And as you do this enough, you get a feel for what the flow should be like, um, which leads to a pricing issue, but but uh, we can discuss that some other time. Um, so so just to kind of you know touch on what you're saying is like the one thing that I when I was working with ghostwriting that I did to to do what you're talking about is I made them or I help brainstorm headlines first because a headline makes the client think very concisely what is this article about like you have to sum it up in 70 characters and then creating an outline from that but the headline always came first because that was like what is the thing you're trying to communicate with this piece do you do you do that so i would say to actually the inverse for my clients they'll come to oh. me and they say we want to write an article about five ways that litigating against a state attorney general is different than a normal commercial litigation matter i say yeah. okay understand. Let's talk about that. And then they might have these half formed thoughts or something they think is a big deal actually could only, you know, you can write 50 words and be done with it, but something else they thought was an afterthought is actually worthy of a couple paragraphs. So yeah, it's actually the inverse. Most of the time it's, they have an idea and the headline might not be fully formed, but, but the topic is fairly formed. It's getting them to think outside of their kind of academic court papers thinking. And instead, how would you approach this in a way that a client would want to hear about it over a lunch, over a coffee, and we kind of go from there. Yeah. And do you set like a specific number of revisions or any kind of like limitations around that? 
I don't, uh, I don't charge by the hour. So that's one reason why I don't, I am shocked when I hear law firm people, law firm marketers or in-house salespeople tell me that their large PR firm charges them for revisions. I don't, yeah. I don't understand that. I, you, you hire me to write an article. I write it. If you have changes to it, I'll keep doing it. And yeah. I'm fortunate based on the quality of my work and, and based on the work I'm doing, we're not going through like 17 turns of a yeah. document, right? It's oh. I'm writing it. They have some line edits normally because they want to say things the way they want them, but it, it is not kind of a, a, a process that goes on forever. It's usually within two or three turns of the document. We're done. Yeah. So in terms of scope creep, I'm sure for a book, it can be even worse. Dan, what is the kind of way that you kind of are your writers? I don't know how much you are hands-on versus handing them off to the writers, but is it is it coming with up with an outline first for the book or like how do you how do you avoid scope creep? Um, it's a great question. I will get to it in just a second. Um, sure. Just want to make two other points first. One is Wayne did a great job of articulating why this community of writers, this kind of work will never be replaced by chat GPT <laughs> and generative AI, right? Yeah. Is, is that the thought partner work before the writing partner work begins is incredibly valuable, arguably the most valuable part of the process. Um, you, can't be, you can't produce great writing without clear thinking. And so much of the good work that people like Wayne do is helping people hone their ideas, be clear about their goals, why they're doing this, and then taking that and distilling it into a, a compelling piece of content. And that's why I actually am very bullish about um, the future of the ghostwriting field at the, at the high level that we're typically working on is because that can't be replaced by um, a mimic um, form of technology. I just submitted in the chat uh, an article that our friend Dave Murray, the head of the Professional Speechwriters Association wrote um, in response to a kind of a flippant comment that the head of Coursera wrote about how he's going to use a, uh, you know, chat GPT as a speechwriter. Um, and David, you know, gave, did a very compelling substantive takedown of why that is uh, foolish and uh, talking about speechwriters and, and by extension, you know, writing partners or ghostwriters as the intellectual blood bank for thought leaders. Yeah. Um, so um, just wanted to kind of yeah. uh, flag that. Well, um, before, you, before we get to the next question, Lee, Lee, you seem to kind of agree with this whole idea that that a ghostwriter is almost like a mint, like a thought mentor to uh, to the the subject of the client. Yeah, I heard Wayne saying that too. Sorry, my camera's not working now. Um, but yeah, I've had big big success in positioning myself as a thought partner. Um, because often a lot of the work is figuring out what you're going to write. You know, yeah. I, I don't often have the case where someone's ordering up a book or ordering up an article, right? It's not like I'm Ooh. just there to, yeah. um, I'm not the factory. I'm helping them come up with who their audience is and what that audience is really craving and how they can uniquely deliver that. Yeah. And kind of to what Pat was speaking about is you're kind of also, you're not just a writer, you're a consultant for you know, the publication, the the positioning of it and everything like that, you're helping them think through, you know, how will people be exposed to this? Where will this be published? A lot of other things are going into it than just writing. Yeah. And you're helping them brand their idea too. That's something I talk to people about a lot. You know, it's not like maybe they're saying, okay, well, we sell employee benefits products. So I want to be a thought leader in employee benefits. It's like, mm -hmm. okay, well, that doesn't really tell me anything, right? Can we, can we brand this idea so that you really have a clear, unique perspective when people hear a certain phrase, they think of you. Yeah. You have definitely. to have a perspective on, on your topic. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I also just wanted to go back to Matt's point about um, pricing and the, you know, the discussion around hourly versus flat fee. Um, mm -hmm. I think, what Matt has shown is that there's not a one size fits all answer, right? So a lot of it's dependent on the kind of work you're doing, but also where you are in the marketplace. And Matt's at a place uh, because of his um, expertise and um, his track record that he can charge in a way that he feels most comfortable with and that works for him. And so the point I would make to people who are maybe you know just breaking into the field and trying to figure some of this out is, before you think about what you charge, it's more important to start with why you're 
chart, why you're charging, what you're going to charge, and how you're going to structure it. And then you're going to be in a better position to figure out um, what the, the, whether it's an hourly rate or what the project fee is going to be. And the other thing to bear in mind is that there's two components to figure out how, what to charge. One is what your, your, the value of the service you're providing is. But then because this field is, so, is kind of opaque and there's not standard setting, authors, clients are coming to this with no baseline of expectations, no understanding of what people charge, right? Mm -hmm. So you also have to figure out what the price sensitivity of the client is. And Matt pointed out very uh, wisely that most of the people he's dealing with are not price sensitive. So in a matter of fact, he could, by charging at a high rate, he is communicating to them, I'm worth it. But then there's a, a whole other spectrum of uh, clients, many of whom are, you know, have a ton of money, who are super price sensitive and will haggle with you and you know feel like they need to kind of get a deal. And so when you're figuring out what to charge, you have to kind of factor in are are they you know um, you know seeing you charging at a high rate as a good thing or a bad thing, and then you have to calibrate accordingly. But at the end of the day, you also just have to know your worth and that if you, someone is saying I don't want to pay you that, to be prepared to sort of say I'm sorry, then I don't think I can help you because. Yeah. A lot of times, if you're willing to draw that line and say, I, this is what my, my value is, people will respect you for that and then might be able to say, say all right, well, I want to work with you. So, you know, I, I can do that. And I think yeah. a mistake a lot of writers early in their, you know, ghostwriting or writing for hire work, make the mistake of feeling the pressure because they want the work to discount or lower their prices. Yeah. And, and, th and that leads to you getting taken advantage of. Yeah, it's, it's so hard to say no. Um, and a lot, and so you hit training yourself to kind of do that as me, as an entrepreneur who's been working for 2014 all, all on my own, it's still something I struggle with. Okay. We have some people raising their hands, Ben, you just had a brief point in the chat about, you know, position, like explaining to the client what a journalist would find interesting. And can you get, just give us like a very brief introduction of your name and what and what you do before and then just explain what you were saying there. Of course, yeah, I'm Ben Woldowski. I'm I guess I usually say I'm a recovering journalist, you know, I still <laughs> I'm affiliated with the University of Virginia and I'm doing a book and I do a lot some writing in my own name. Mm -hmm. Also dipping my toes more into the ghostwriting and consulting world. That, that that's one if we have time that's a whole other question which is I find this blurring of identities is actually quite challenging in terms of fully fully diving in and marketing myself as a ghostwriter. But to answer yeah. your question, I have a, a major client, Global Education Corporation, and I help with ghostwriting for executives or some of their partners might be a college president who wants a piece in Inside Higher Ed or one of the well-known education publications. And um, I find that, the, I guess what I'm, what I'm really, what's resonating with me is the thought partner part. When you spend maybe 30 minutes on the phone with somebody and somebody from the corporation or even somebody from the university thinks something's a story and it's not, that's not the story and that's not interesting. And, yeah. or they, they say a lot of stuff and maybe one, one tenth of it might make something uh, you, you could do it a piece. If you structured it, ABC telling them that wearing your journalist's hat is actually a real service to them. And I think that it's actually, I, I completely understand. You do have to treat them as a client. You're trying to deliver value for them, but by trying to be a bit of a, a purist about what's a good story, you can still be a journalist and still be really giving your client the best service. Yeah, and I think like th th that's why journal former journalists sometimes can make really great ghostwriters is because they can they can always name check that expertise, and it also helps them in terms of standing above the rest. If you can name check a name check a bunch of publications that you've written for. Um, I always found that as a great way to get a client warmed up and and ready to hire you. Uh, you know, saying you wrote for the Atlantic or New York Magazine or different stuff like that. So there's like a lot of ways, and also the the you know you, on the journalist side, you have a lot of understanding of what works from a content perspective. If if you were one of those journalists who had access to your traffic stats and stuff like that, so there's like a lot of expertise that transfers well from journalism uh, to ghostwriting. Um, Evan, I think you had your hand up next. Yeah. Um, so I guess I should clarify that the ghostwriting I do is typically for artists. And so I typically write grants for them. Yeah. Uh, I haven't really been pursuing that full time. And I will be doing that shortly in the future. I'm, just, mm -hmm. I'm transferring into a more independent form of work. Uh, but I feel like on this note of like 
thought partnership versus ghostwriting, I, my struggle is that I feel like people come to me with problems that I solve in maybe 10 minutes. Yeah. And then they are expecting it to take two or three hours. And so by the time I'm writing a grant, I've pretty much given away all my value thoughtlessly because to me, the problem is that simple. And so I'm wondering if people have kind of structures they use to kind of gate the conversation um, or to kind of add extra, well, not, not extra value per se in the writing, but I, I basically want to push people into investing more because I, I know I'm giving quite a bit away. Yeah, um, I'll, I'll throw this, uh, I'll throw this question to Jonathan, but like my kind of initial reaction is like, I, I mean, what's the famous anecdote about, and you'd probably know this since you know artist about the artist who comes to lunch and Picasso. it takes up. Yeah, yeah, it takes him a few minutes to draw something, but he charges some enormous amount of money. And when the person confronts him and says, why are you charging so much? And he says, when it only took you five minutes, and he says, well, it took me 30 years to learn how to do that. I don't know. I'm probably butchering that anecdote. But Jonathan, I'm going to throw to you for that one. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, I mean, we're we're in lockstep about the, the principle here. I think the... Um, uh, to the extent I can I bring value to the, the question, a uh, couple sort of small techniques. So one thing, if it takes you five minutes to do the work, um, there's a temptation to, to show off how fast and efficient you were and sending it to the client immediately, uh, you know, in minute six, resist that temptation, <laughs> uh, send it to them the next day, schedule the email, um, you use Gmail or Outlook doesn't matter, but get it off of your mental sort of load. Um, and send it the next day so that they think you were putting time into this. I had a client once very early on, I did his resume and I was so excited. It was so easy to do. And I sent it to him and he had the temerity, although he was right to say, Hey, why don't you spend a little time on this? I, you know, paid you a lot of money for it. Um, and I think uh, the, the, the one other sort of related point. So just going back to something we discussed earlier, I remembered Simon, finally, what I wanted to say, you know, one, when we're talking about, uh, uh, charging a lot of money. Uh, this is another resume story. So a guy yesterday or the day before came to me, uh, can you help me with my resume? And I knew he was price sensitive. I am. We, we are all not as lucky as Matthew Reese to have price insensitive clients. <laughs> and uh, um, in fact, this guy said, you know, uh, he made a point of mentioning, I hope, you can I hope he, he could afford me or something. So I try to always do this, but especially in cases where clients broach a uh, 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 budget. Um, I gave him free advice. I did a free analysis of his resume. And I said, here are like six things that you would want that you, you may want to look at. And I offer these just as a courtesy. But in doing so, I demonstrate value, because if I'm going to charge a lot of money, certainly a lot more than you know what they're charging on Upwork, I want to prove my worth beyond just saying, hey, I've been published in, you know, the Wall Street Journal, I can give them some uh, individualized advice. Yeah. Evan, did we did we interpret your question correctly? Is this like you're finishing, like you're able to solve their problem in five minutes on the phone? Or is this stuff that you're sending them work product later? I think mostly over the phone. And I think part of it is like people don't understand what grants are unless they don't yeah. understand the value. And so I'm right now I'm making a kind of it's an experimental sample portfolio because I also do design work. And yeah. so it's basically a Google Doc that shows what I can make with just Google Doc. Um, and it's got like images and writing in it. But yeah. I think I think part of it is just like maybe when you're when you're writing um, for an outlet like Fortune or Bloomberg, like even even if you let's say there was like a dud article and you just like couldn't get the person's ideas to be compelling. The fact that it is in that location does enough that I think it kind of justifies the cost. Yeah. And so one of the challenges I think I'm starting to overcome is now that I've had success, I can point towards my past success and, and justify kind of why I charge things, but that still doesn't really uh, match what I call the actual value that, yeah. they, that, that that labor typically. And it's the same thing with journalists and researchers. Like, you know, if you go to an outlet, they're going to want to pay you 50 cents a word. I don't have time for that. And I don't pitch because of that. Yeah. Uh, I tend to work closer to like 150 to $200 an hour. Yeah. I, um, well, like, 
I mean, if some of what your values you're giving is just advice. I mean, you can monetize that. Like I, I have like a thing where people can book phone calls with me and it's like an automatic thing where they just upload their credit card information and they get me for an hour and it's $250. So they're getting my advice, but they're also getting me on a one-on-one basis. Like a lot of them, they're just, they just want someone to talk to them. Like they, they like this kind of personal touch to it. And a lot of them will pay for that. I don't know if that's also a solution as well is, is some kind of like introductory consulting fee to get on the phone with them or something like that. But that's one way you can kind of monetize that advice where you, you feel like you're just like giving them some advice over the phone, but they actually, a lot of, you know, people will actually pay for that kind of stuff. Hey, Simon, can I, yeah. uh, I know we're probably nearing the end. I was hoping to just- Well, I guess one thing I would say is, oh, yeah. we, you know, we're at the we're at the top of the hour. I won't get okay. offended if anyone has to drop off, but I'm always happy to continue talking for as long as there is organic discussion. So, uh, okay, keep on going. Yeah, I was just gonna say that there was just two points. So um, one is I often am asked, you know, how do you capture the voice of the person you're writing for? and I don't always say this, but I'll say it to this group. Um, I, my experience is that there are not that many people who actually have a distinctive voice. <laughs> yeah. So it's not worth kind of beating yourself up to try to capture that. It's one thing if you're writing for the president of the United States, but your garden variety CEO, you can. it's worth looking to see what they've said before. But um, the reality is a lot of the time, I never even talk to the person for whom I'm writing a speech. And oh, so- interesting. Yeah. And so I, you know, I kind of have a sense of the way things should be said in speeches. And I just, that's just the way I write it. And I don't, I don't spend too much time trying again, uh, over trying to capture that voice. The second thing is it's something that Wayne said about the jigsaw puzzle pieces, which I think is, it's exactly how I uh, uh, often describe it, which is you're working, I don't know, there's a thousand pieces to the puzzle and you might start with, you know, a hundred. And so how are you going to get the you know the other 900 and um my experience is that that the temptation is to ask the client to to give you all this information um my experience is that they the reason they've hired you is they basically they just want you to figure it out they don't want to have it and almost by definition they're too busy to do this and so they don't want a bunch of questions so i just I just do it. I, you know, I end up doing all the research. I am often given nothing other than the topic and I don't talk to the principal and, you know, through Google and a lot of other resources, I mean, you can basically find everything usually that you need. And, um, and look, if you don't get something right, you know, they're going to tell you and it's not. And so there's always a safety net, but I find the the lower maintenance you are and the less you have to ask questions and can just give them something that's as close to finished as possible, the happier they're going to be. Yeah, in terms of like the voice, my way of doing that, I never wrote books, but I was always writing like op-eds and stuff like that is I would record the conversation, create a transcript, and then I would actually try to use as many of their own words as possible by like copying and pasting and then building yeah. a str- and cleaning up their sentences, but yeah. try, trying to use their own words as much as possible. That's what I was always yeah. trying to do. No, I, I'm, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Lee, you had your hand raised for a little bit. I don't know if you... Um, yeah, I wanted to comment a while back. Um, but Matt, I just want to say, I don't know. I, I, I don't really agree with, I, I take an opposite approach. I, I don't know if I would, uh, call anyone a garden variety CEO, you know, I feel like a human is a human. And I feel like part of my job as a ghostwriter is to do some digging to figure out what their unique perspective is. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe I'm just yeah, approaching no, it from I, a different I angle. Don't, I don't disagree, but I just, having been doing this for 17 years, I, um, I don't know. I haven't. I I will try to get as much as as, as what they have said. But again, often they never speak to me. <laughs> so there's a so um, so there's some kind of middleman that's like working like a PR firm or something like that. Yeah, or the the head of communications or whatever. And so um, I always look. I always tell these clients, look, the more you can give me, the better. But um, they're more often than not, I'm given. You know. I'm given less than more. And so it's really up to me to, um, and I, you know, we talked about kind of the whole thought partner part of it. And again, I mean, I'm often, you know, like I'm the one doing the thinking they're not, they're, they're really, they're literally almost giving me nothing. And so, um, 
And, and that sort of gets into the whole pricing issue, going back to what we were talking about earlier, which is I just say, look, the less you give me, the longer it's going to take. And so it's going to cost more. And again, but a lot of these clients, they don't, they're too busy to, to do any of that. And they don't really care what it costs. Whereas you, Lee, you like to get on the phone and do I record only the conversations. With, yeah, I only work directly with the thought leader. Um, do, you, do you record the conversations or you're just taking notes? I or? do. Yeah, no, I always record. Um, mm. And, you know, I mean, I've done some ghostwriting for traditional publishers. And that's when you get into kind of a different category of ghostwriting, where ethically, you're only allowed to use words that came out of the person's mouth. Mm. Um, so I've kind of worked on the spectrum, like the market, the, a marketing agency has the loosest definition, probably traditional publishers have the most strict definition. Um, but one thing that kind of relates this conversation to the pricing question that a couple of people had earlier is that I have found that the closer I can get to that executive leader, the easier time I have charging exactly what I want to charge because they mm -hmm. hold the purse strings, they are in control of the budget. So if they see me as their partner, they're like, yeah, pay Lee whatever she wants. You know, if I talk to the yeah. marketer three levels down, they might have a hard time getting that approved or, you know, my fee is higher than their threshold. They have to get approved. But if I'm working directly with the CEO, it's almost like a non-issue. Mm -hmm. I think. So. Well, how do you, yeah. And how do you do that though? Like, how do you get to that person? Well, I mean, yeah, it has to start from a place of trust. So most of my work is comes through referrals where a CEO will get my name to another CEO and I'll get like a one line email that's like set up something with my EA. I heard you, you're good. Yeah. And I'm very happy to come in that way. Um, yeah. And then I have a rule. I mean, if I come in through a, the marketers, I'm, I'm not going to write something unless I've had some kind of FaceTime with the author. Yeah. And Lee, just introduce, I, I forgot to ask you to introduce yourself to the audience. Can you just give us like a one line oh, sure. introduction? <laughs> Yeah, I'm a thought leadership ghostwriter. I came at this through um, working at marketing agencies. And now I, for the last three years, I've worked for myself as a solo thought leadership strategist. And I write books and long form thought leadership. And your name is Lee Price for, for, Lee those, Price. Listen, yeah. for those listening at home. Pat, what um, in terms of your, and you're on mute again, so don't forget to unmute yourself. Um, do you record the conversations? How do you, how, how do you prefer to work with your clients? I definitely record them because with, you know, when you're doing a book and especially if you're doing a life story, it's, it's long and you're going, you have chapters of material, mm -hmm. but I also find uh, that unlike this thought leadership thing, I feel it's more like therapy, what I'm doing <laughs> because they're telling their story and they're, there'll be the surface story and you'll get through that. And then you'll go back and you'll get the real story. And then you'll often get things that are, things that they've never even thought of talking about before. Yeah. And so it's really very satisfying. And the only yeah. thing that might happen is that what they say may in the end, in some way, alienate or bother other people in the family who are we're not sure they want this story to come to the world. And yeah. so then you have to negotiate that because you're, the family's paying you usually not for me they're usually not the person who's telling the story but somebody else yeah and so you have to walk this line between what's you know what's acceptable and what maybe we could moderate so that it wouldn't make there was a story about somebody putting a child in an oven and cooking them and uh, somebody who was sort of wacky and that that one definitely didn't go in <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> it's interesting what you're saying about the therapy thing. I think that is so much of consulting. And you think of like these management consultants who are really just coming in to say to be yes men to whatever the, the CEO wants in a lot of way. And I think like so many clients just value someone getting on the phone or in person talking to them. And that's what they're, you know, they don't realize that's what they're paying for, but that you as a consultant at the longer you work in this, and this kind of goes back to me now doing these like consulting phone calls where I just get on and get on for an hour. Cause there's only so much advice I can give if I can't do research before or after I'm just getting on for that that one hour but they do they 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 receive my newsletter in their inbox regularly they listen to my podcast they may have heard me like being you know boomed into their ears for hours on end so this like value of having this personal conversation I think is like so valuable to a client yeah I I've been told that I've lifted people out of depression <laughs> for just just by listening to their story and a lot of the people in the family may have heard the story before even over and over again but never with a kind of apparent fascination 
I mean, awesome. I wasn't always fascinated, but you kind of, yeah, you know, you yeah. learn how to. Yeah, I'm sure every consultant knows knows how to pretend to be fascinated with whatever. Right. Okay, yeah. well, well, we're pushing up, uh, you know, way past the hour. I'm going to go ahead and and uh, kind of wind down. And I know some people had to drop off, but I want to thank right. all the remaining people. Um, this is actually going to go out to my full. I, I pick one of these a month and then convert it into an actual podcast episode that goes out to my full uh, podcast feed. So. Uh, that um that'll be going out um next week um thank you all so much for joining and and uh giving your expertise this was another amazing uh office hours and i think you know it's, it was definitely illuminating for people who I, I have a lot of writers and content creators who who want to break into this space but uh but they don't know how so i definitely think this is a good primer for that but uh thank you so much for joining me everybody